From the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Saturday evening session of the 194th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session will be provided by a choir of missionaries currently serving in the Utah area. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. Elder Ronald A. Rasband of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to this Saturday evening session of the 194th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We note that President Russell M. Nelson and President Jeffrey R. Holland are both viewing this session from their homes. We welcome all who are participating in these proceedings by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. The music for this session will be provided by a choir of missionaries currently serving in the Utah area under the direction of Corey Mendenhall with Shemaine Evans, with Linda Margetts and Joseph Peoples at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing, will bring the world his truth. The invocation will then be offered by Elder the Nelson Silva of the Seventy, after which the choir will sing, I Will Walk with Jesus.
Our beloved Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this opportunity and privilege to be together before Thee to express our gratitude for all the things that we have learned from the previous sessions of the General Conference. We thank Thee for the restoration of Thy Gospel by Thy Son, Jesus Christ, through the prophet Joseph Smith. We thank Thee for the Holy Scriptures. We thank Thee for the gift of the Holy Ghost. We thank Thee for being guided by living prophets, prophets, seers, and revelators. We thank Thee, Father, for the technology that allow Thy words to be preached all over the world. Father, we kindly ask Thee to bless those that are in need, that they can find peace, hope, to the things that you be taught in this, general, in this session, in this general conference. Father, we ask Thee to bless us with understand, patience, and above all, a Christ-like love for all thy children in the earth. Father, we love thee, and we say these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
We will now be pleased to hear from Elder Garrett W. Gong of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Sister Kristen M. Yi, who serves as second counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency. The choir will then sing the Iron Rod. After the singing, we will hear from Elders Kyle S. McKay and Jorge M. Alvarado of the Seventy. Our recent Gong family reunion included a fun talent show, complete with a dad jokes contest. But this contest was unusual. On one team was Grandpa, me, and two of the grandchildren, ages 12 and 11. On the other team was an artificial intelligence AI program prompted by a cousin to tell dad jokes in the style of Garrett W. Gong. <laughs> Grandpa Garrett Gong versus AI Garrett Gong. The grandchildren and I went first. What do you call a dinosaur who crashes his car? Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> AI Garrett Gong was instructed, think like Garrett W. Gong, talk like him. A.I. Garrett Gong, quote, Here is a dad joke of this spoken by Garrett W. Gong, embracing his warm, thoughtful, and uplifting style. <laughs> <laughs> Why did the humble tree make people smile? Because it was rooted in love and reached out with branches of kindness. Like that tree, we too can find strength in our roots and joy in extending kindness to others." End quote. Well, what do you think? That's why they're called dad jokes. All around us are opportunities to laugh, delight, see with grateful eyes. Ours is a gospel of joy and holiness in everyday life. Holiness sets things apart for sacred purpose. But holiness also invites us to infuse daily living with the sacred, to rejoice in daily bread amidst this world's thistles and thorns. To walk with the Lord, we must become holy, for He is holy. And to help us become holy, the Lord invites us to walk with Him. We each have a story. As Sister Gong and I meet you, church members and friends in many places and circumstances, your stories of holiness to the Lord in everyday life inspire us. You live seven C's, communion with God, community and compassion with each other, commitment and covenant with God, family, and friends, centered in Jesus Christ. Growing evidence highlights this striking fact. Religious believers are, on average, happier, healthier, and more fulfilled than those without spiritual commitment or connection. Happiness and life satisfaction, mental and physical health, meaning and purpose, character and virtue, close social relationships, even financial and material stability. On each measure, religious practitioners flourish. They enjoy better physical and mental health and greater life satisfaction across all ages and demographic groups. What researchers call religious structural stability offers clarity, purpose, and inspiration amidst life's twists and turns. The household of faith and community of saints combat isolation and the lonely crowd. Holiness to the Lord says no to the profane, no to starky cleverness at others' expense, no to algorithms that monetize anger or polarization. Holiness to the Lord says yes to the sacred and reverent, yes to our becoming our freest, happiest, most authentic best selves as we follow Him in faith. What does holiness to the Lord in everyday life look like? Holiness to the Lord in everyday life looks like two faithful young adults married for a year, 
sharing with authenticity and vulnerability gospel covenants, sacrifice, and service in their unfolding lives. She begins, quote, in high school, I was in a dark place. I felt like God wasn't there for me. One night a text from a friend said, hey, have you read Alma 36 ever? As I started reading, she said, I was overcome with peace and love. I felt like I was being given this big hug. When I read Alma chapter 36, verse 12, I knew Heavenly Father saw me and knew exactly how I was feeling. She continues, before we got married, I was honest with my, my fiance that I didn't have a great testimony of tithing. Why did God need us to give money when others had so much to give? My fiance helped explain it's not about money, but following a commandment asked of us. He challenged me to start paying tithing. I really saw my testimony grow, she says. Sometimes money gets tight, but we saw so many blessings and somehow paychecks were enough. Also, in my nursing class, she said I was the only member of the church and the only one married. Many times I left class frustrated or crying because I felt classmates single me out and made negative comments about my beliefs, my wearing my garments, or my being married so young. Yet, she continues, this past semester, I learned how to better voice my beliefs and be a good gospel example. My knowledge and testimony grew because I was tested in my ability to stand alone and be strong in what I believe." End quote. The young huntsman adds, quote, before my mission, I had offers to play college baseball, making the difficult decision. I put those offers aside and went to serve the Lord. I wouldn't trade those two years for anything. Returning home, he said, I expected a difficult transition, but found myself stronger, faster, and healthier. I was throwing harder than when I left. I had more offers to play than when I left, including my dream school. And most importantly, he said, I rely upon the Lord more than ever. He concludes, as a missionary, I taught that Heavenly Father promises us power in our prayers, but sometimes I forget that for myself." End quote. Our treasury of missionary holiness to the Lord blessings is rich and full. Finances, timing, and other circumstances are often not easy. But when missionaries of all ages and backgrounds consecrate holiness to the Lord, things can work out in the Lord's time and way. Now, with a 48-year perspective, a senior missionary shares, quote, my dad wanted me to get a college education, not go on a mission. Shortly after that, he had a heart attack and died at age 47. I felt guilty. How could I make things right with my father? Later, he continues, after I decided to serve a mission, I saw my father in a dream. Peaceful and contented, he was happy I would serve. This senior missionary continues, as Doctrine and Covenants section 138 teaches, I believe my father could serve as a missionary in the spirit world. I picture my father helping our great-grandfather, who left Germany at age 17 and was lost to the family, be found again." End quote. His wife adds, among the five brothers in my husband's family, the four who served missions are the ones with college degrees. End quote. Holiness to the Lord in everyday life looks like a young returning missionary who learned to let God prevail in his life. Earlier, when asked to bless someone who was very sick, this missionary said, I have faith. I'll bless him to recover. Yet the returning missionary says, I learned in that moment to pray not for what I wanted, for what the Lord knew the person needed. I blessed the brother with peace and comfort. He later passed away peacefully." End quote. Holiness to the Lord in everyday life looks like a spark arcing across the veil to connect, comfort, and strengthen. An administrator in a major university says he feels individuals he knows only by reputation praying for him. Those individuals devoted their life to the university and continue to care about its mission and students. 
A sister does her best each day after her husband was unfaithful to her and the children. I deeply admire her and others like her. One day while folding laundry, her hand on a stack of garments, she sighed to herself, what's the point? She felt a tender voice assure her, your covenants are with me. For 50 years, another sister yearned for a relationship with her father. Growing up, she says, there were my brothers and my dad, and then there was me, the only daughter. All I ever wanted was to be good enough for my dad. Then my mom passed away. She was my only liaison between my dad and me. One day, the sister said, I heard a voice say, invite your dad and take him to the temple with you. That was the beginning of a twice a month date with my daddy to the house of the Lord. I told my dad I loved him. He told me he loved me too. Spending time in the house of the Lord has healed us. My mother could not help us on earth. It took her being on the other side of the veil to help mend what was broken. The temple completed our journey to wholeness as an eternal family." End quote. The Father says, the temple dedication was a great spiritual experience for me and my only daughter. Now we attend together and feel our love strengthen. End quote. Holiness to the Lord in everyday life includes tender moments when loved ones pass. Earlier this year, my dear mother, Jean Gong, slipped into the next life, days before her 98th birthday. If you ask my mother, would you like Rocky Road, white chocolate ginger, or strawberry ice cream, mom would say, yes, please, may I taste each one? Who could say no to your mother, especially when she loved all of life's flavors? I once asked mom which decisions had most shaped her life. She said, being baptized a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and moving from Hawaii to the mainland where I met your father. Baptized as a 15-year-old, the only member of her large family to join our church, my mother had covenant faith and trust in the Lord that blessed her life and all our family generations. I miss my mother, as you miss members in your family. But I know my mother is not gone. She's just not here now. I honor her and all who pass as valiant examples of everyday holiness to the Lord. Of course, holiness to the Lord in everyday life includes coming more often to the Lord in his holy house. This is true whether we are church members or friends. Three friends came to the Bangkok Thailand Temple Open House. This is a place of super healing, said one. In the baptistry, another said, when I'm here, I want to be washed clean and never sin again. The third said, can you feel the spiritual power? With nine sacred words, our temples invite and proclaim holiness to the Lord, the house of the Lord. Holiness to the Lord makes daily living sacred. It draws us closer and happier to the Lord and each other and prepares us to live with God our Father, Jesus Christ, and our loved ones. As did my friend, you may wonder if your Heavenly Father loves you. The answer is a resounding, absolute yes. We can feel his love as we make holiness to the Lord ours each day, happy and forever. May we do so, I pray, in the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. About 10 years ago, I felt impressed to paint a portrait of the Savior. Though I'm an artist, this felt a bit overwhelming. How was I to paint a portrait of Jesus Christ 
that captured his spirit. Where was I to begin, and where would I find the time? Even with my questions, I decided to move forward and trust that the Lord would help me, but I had to keep moving and leave the possibilities to him. I prayed, pondered, researched, and sketched, and was blessed to find help and resources. And what was a white canvas started to become something more. The process wasn't easy. Sometimes it didn't look as I had hoped. Sometimes there were moments of inspired strokes and ideas, and many times I just had to try again and again and again. When I thought the oil painting was finally complete and dry, I began to apply a transparent varnish to protect it from dirt and dust. As I did, I noticed the hair in the painting start to change, smear, and dissolve. I quickly realized that I had applied the varnish too soon. That part of the painting was still wet. I had literally wiped away a portion of my painting with the varnish. Oh, how my heart sank. I felt as though I had just destroyed what God had helped me to do. I cried and felt sick inside. And in despair, I did what anyone would typically do in a situation like this. I called my mother. <laughs> she wisely and calmly said, you won't get back what you had, but do the very best you can with what you've got. So I prayed and pled for help and painted through the night to repair things. And I remember looking at the painting in the morning. It looked better than it did before. How is that possible? What I thought was a mistake without mend was an opportunity for his merciful hand to be manifest. He was not done with the painting, and he was not done with me. What joy and relief filled my heart. I praise the Lord for his mercy, for this miracle that not only saved the painting, but taught me more about his love and power to save each of us from our weaknesses, mistakes, and sins and to help us to become something more. Just as the depth of my gratitude for the Savior grew as he mercifully helped me to repair the unrepairable painting, so as my personal love and gratitude for my Savior intensified, I have sought to work with him on my weaknesses and to be forgiven of my mistakes. I will forever be grateful to my Savior that I can change and be cleansed. He has my heart and I hope to do whatever he would have me do and become. Repenting allows us to feel God's love and to know and love him in ways we would never otherwise know. Of the woman who anointed the Savior's feet, he said, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. She loved Jesus much, for he had forgiven her much. There is such relief and hope in knowing that we can try again, that as Elder Bednar taught, we can receive an ongoing remission of our sins through the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost as we truly and sincerely repent. The redeeming power of Jesus Christ is one of the greatest promised blessings of our covenants. Ponder this as you participate in sacred ordinances. Without it, we could not return home to the presence of our Father in heaven and those we love. I know that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is mighty to save. As the Son of God who atoned for the sins of the world and laid down his own life and took it up again, he holds the power of redemption and resurrection. He has made possible immortality for all and eternal life for those who choose him. I know that through his atoning sacrifice, we can repent and truly be cleansed and redeemed. It is a miracle he loves you and me in this way. He has said, will you not now return unto me and repent of your sins and be converted that I may heal you? He can heal the waste places of your soul, the places made dry, harsh, and desolate by sin and sorrow and make your wilderness like Eden. Just as we cannot comprehend the agony and depth of Christ's suffering in Gethsemane and on the cross, so we cannot measure the bounds nor fathom the depths of his divine forgiveness, 
mercy, and love. You may feel at times that it's not possible to be redeemed, that perhaps you are an exception to God's love and the atoning power of Jesus Christ because of what you are struggling with or because of what you've done. But I testify that you are not beneath the Master's reach. The Savior descended below all things and is in a divine position to lift you and claim you from the darkest abyss and bring you into his marvelous light. Through his sufferings, he has made a way for each of us to overcome our personal weaknesses and sins. He has all power to save every man that believeth on his name and bringeth forth fruit meat for repentance. Just as it required work and pleading for heaven's help to repair the painting, it takes work, sincerity of heart, and humility to bring forth fruit meat for repentance. These fruits include exercising our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice, offering to God a broken heart and a contrite spirit, confessing and forsaking sin, restoring that which is damaged to the best of our ability, and striving to live righteously. To truly repent and change, we must first be convinced of our sins. A person does not see the need to take medicine unless they understand that they are ill. There may be times we may not be willing to look inside ourselves and see that which really needs healing and repair. In C.S. Lewis's writings, Aslan poses these words to a man that has entangled himself in his own devices. O oh, humankind, how cleverly you defend yourselves from all that might do you good. Where might you and I be defending ourselves from those things that might do us good? Let us not defend ourselves from the good that God desires to bless us with, from the love and mercy that He desires us to feel, from the light and knowledge He desires to bestow upon us, from the healing that He knows we so readily need, from the deeper covenant relationship He intends for all His sons and daughters. I pray we may lay aside any weapons of war that we've consciously or even unconsciously taken up to defend ourselves from the blessings of God's love. Weapons of pride, selfishness, fear, hate, offense, complacency, unrighteous judgment, jealousies, anything that would keep us from loving God with all our hearts and keeping all our covenants with Him. As we live our covenants, the Lord can give us the help and power we need to both recognize and overcome our weaknesses, including the spiritual parasite of pride. Our prophet has said, repentance is the pathway to purity, and purity brings power. And oh, how we will need his power in the days ahead. Like my painting, the Lord is not done with us when we make a mistake, nor does he flee when we falter. Our need for healing and help is not a burden to him, but the very reason he came. The Savior himself said, Behold, I have come into the world to bring redemption unto the world, to save the world from sin. Mine arm of mercy is extended towards you, and whosoever will come, him will I receive. And blessed are those who come unto me. So come. Come, ye that are weary, worn, and sad. Come, and leave your labors and find rest in him who loves you most. Take his yoke upon you, for he is gentle and lowly in heart. Our Heavenly Father and Savior see you. They know your heart. They care about what you care about, including those you love. The Savior can redeem that which was lost, including broken and fractured relationships. He has made way for all that has fallen to be redeemed, to breathe life into that which feels dead and hopeless. If you are struggling with a situation you think you should have overcome by now, don't give up. Be patient with yourself. Keep your covenants. Repent often. Seek the help of your leaders if needed, and go to the house of the Lord as regularly as you can. Listen for and heed the promptings He sends you. He will not abandon his covenant relationship with you. There have been difficult and complex relationships in my life that I've struggled with 
and sincerely sought to improve. Now, at times I felt like I was failing more often than not. I wondered, did I not fix things the last time? Did I not truly overcome my weakness? I've learned over time that I'm not necessarily defective. Rather, there is more work to be done and more healing that is needed. Elder D. Todd Christofferson taught, Surely the Lord smiles upon one who desires to come to judgment worthily, who resolutely labors day by day to replace weakness with strength. Real repentance, real change may require repeated attempts, but there is something refining and holy in such striving. Divine forgiveness and healing flow quite naturally to such a soul. Each day is a new day filled with hope and possibilities because of Jesus Christ. Each day you and I can come to know, as Mother Eve proclaimed, the joy of our redemption, the joy of being made whole, the joy of feeling God's unfailing love for you. I know that our Father in heaven and Savior love you. Jesus Christ is the Savior and Redeemer of all mankind. He lives, and through his atoning sacrifice, the bands of sin and death were forever broken so that we might be free to choose healing, redemption, and eternal life with those we love. And I testify of these things in his name, Jesus Christ. Amen.
My purpose this day and always is to testify of Jesus Christ, that He is the Son of God, the Creator and Savior of the world, our Deliverer and Redeemer. Because the fundamental principles of our religion is the testimony of the apostles and prophets concerning Jesus Christ, today I share with you my knowledge and testimony of the Savior as it has been strengthened and deepened by the life and teachings of one key apostle and prophet. On the morning of a beautiful, clear day early in the spring of 1820, 14-year-old Joseph Smith entered a grove of trees near his family's home to pray about his sins and to ask which church to join. His sincere prayer, offered with unwavering faith, received the attention of the most powerful forces in the universe, including the Father and the Son and the Devil. Each of these had an intense interest in that prayer and in that boy. What we now call the first vision marked the beginning of the restoration of all things in this last dispensation. But for Joseph, the experience was also personal and preparatory. All he wanted was forgiveness and direction. The Lord gave him both. The instruction to join none of the churches was directive. The words, Thy sins are forgiven thee, were redemptive. For all the beautiful truths we might learn from that first vision, perhaps Joseph's main takeaway was simply, I had found the testimony of James to be true, that a man who lacked wisdom might ask of God and obtain. As one scholar noted, quote, the real resonance of the first vision today is to know that it's the nature of God to give to those who lack wisdom. The God that reveals himself to Joseph Smith in the sacred grove is a God who answers teenagers in times of trouble." Close quote. Joseph's experience in the grove gave him confidence to ask for forgiveness and direction for the rest of his life. His experience has also given me confidence to ask for forgiveness and direction for the rest of my life. On September 21, 1823, Joseph earnestly prayed for forgiveness, confident that because of his experience in the grove three years earlier, heaven would respond again. And it did. The Lord sent an angel, Moroni, to instruct Joseph and inform him of an ancient record he would later translate by the gift and power of God, the Book of Mormon. Almost 13 years after that, Joseph and Oliver Cowdery knelt in solemn, silent prayer in the newly dedicated Kirtland Temple. We do not know what they prayed for but their prayers likely included a plea for forgiveness. For as they arose, the Savior appeared and declared, Behold, your sins are forgiven you. You are clean before me. In the months and years after this experience, Joseph and Oliver would sin again and again. But in that moment, for that moment, in response to their plea and in preparation for the glorious restoration of priesthood keys that was about to happen, Jesus made them sinless. Joseph's life of regular repentance gives me confidence to come boldly unto the throne of grace that I may obtain mercy. I have learned that Jesus Christ truly is of a forgiving disposition. It is neither His mission nor His nature to condemn. He came to save. As part of the promised restitution of all things, the Lord, through Joseph Smith, brought forth the Book of Mormon 
and other revelations that contain the fullness of his gospel. Vital truths were given clarity and completeness as Joseph repeatedly inquired of the Lord for direction. Consider the following. The Father and the Son have bodies as tangible as man's. Jesus took upon himself not only our sins, but also our sicknesses, afflictions, and infirmities. His Atonement was so excruciating, it caused him to bleed from every pore. We are saved by His grace after all we can do. There are conditions to Christ's mercy. As we come unto Christ, He will not only forgive our sins, but He will also change our very nature so that we have no more disposition to do evil. Christ always commands His people to build temples where He manifests Himself unto them and endows them with power from on high. I testify that all these things are true and necessary. They represent only a fraction of the fullness that was restored by Jesus Christ through Joseph Smith in response to Joseph's recurring requests for direction. In 1842, Joseph wrote of amazing things that would come to pass in this last dispensation. He declared that during our day, quote, the heavenly priesthood will unite with the earthly to bring about those great purposes. And whilst we are thus united in one common cause to roll forth the kingdom of heaven, the heavenly priesthood are not idle spectators, close quote. In a statement to his friend, Benjamin Johnson, Joseph said, Benjamin, if I die, I would not be far away from you. And if on the other side of the veil, I would still be working with you and with a power greatly increased to roll on this kingdom. On June 27th, 1844, Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram were murdered. Joseph's body was laid to rest, but his testimony continues to reverberate around the world and in my soul. His words, I had seen a vision. I knew it, and I knew that God knew it, and I could not deny it. I never told you I was perfect, but there is no error in the revelations which I have taught. The fundamental principles of our religion is the testimony of the apostles and prophets concerning Jesus Christ, that He died, was buried, and rose again the third day, and ascended up into heaven. And all other things are only appendages to these which pertain to our religion. What was said of John the Baptist might also be said of Joseph Smith. There was a man sent from God whose name was Joseph. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light, that all men through him might believe. I believe. I believe and am sure that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I testify that the living God is our loving Father. I know this because the voice of the Lord has spoken it to me, and so has the voice of His servants, the apostles and prophets, including and beginning with Joseph Smith. I testify that Joseph Smith was and is a prophet of God, a witness and servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was blessed to open the last dispensation, and we are blessed that he did. The Lord commanded Oliver Cowdery, Stand by my servant Joseph faithfully. 
I testify that the Lord stands by his servant Joseph and the restoration wrought through him. Joseph Smith is now part of that heavenly priesthood of which he spoke. As he promised his friend, he is not far away from us, and on the other side of the veil, he is still working with us and with a power greatly increased to roll on this kingdom. With joy and thanksgiving, I raise my voice in praise to the man who communed with Jehovah. And above all, praise to Jehovah who communed with that man. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 I testified of a loving Heavenly Father. In the April 2019 General Conference moment after being sustained as a new responsibility as a General Authority 70, the choir sang a rendition, I stand on a maze that pierced my heart and soul. I marvel that he will descend from his throne divine to rescue a soul so proud as mine that he shall extend his great love into such as I, sufficient to own, to redeem, and to justify. As I heard those words, I was all amazed. I felt that despite my, in my inadequacies and flaws, the Lord blessed me to know that in His strength I can do all things. The common feeling of inadequacy, weakness, or even unworthiness is something which wish many of us struggle. I still struggle with this. I felt it the day it was called. I have felt it many times, and I still feel it right now speaking to you. However, I have learned that I'm not alone with these feelings. In fact, there are many accounts in the scriptures of those who have seemed to have felt similar feelings. For example, we remember Nephi as a faithful and valiant servant of the Lord. At times, even he struggled with feelings of unworthiness, weakness, and inadequacy. He said, notwithstanding the great goodness of the Lord in showing me the great and marvelous work my heart claimeth, O oh, wretched man that I am. Yea, my heart soareth because of my flesh. My soul grieveth because of my iniquities. The prophet Joseph Smith spoke of often feeling condemned in his youth for his weakness and imperfections. But Joseph's feeling of inadequacy and worry were part of what led him to ponder, study, learn, and pray. As you may remember, he went to pray in the grove near his home to find truth, peace, and forgiveness. He heard the Lord say, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Go thy way, walk in my statutes, and keep my commandments. Behold, I am the Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world, that all those who believe in my name may have eternal life. Joseph's sincere desire to repent and seek the salvation of his soul, helping to come to Jesus Christ and receive forgiveness of his sins. The continuous effort opened the door to the continuing restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This remarkable experience of the prophet Joseph Smith illustrates how feeling of weaknesses and inadequacy can help us recognize our fallen nature. If we are humble, this will help us come to recognize our dependence upon Jesus Christ and stir within our heart a sincere desire to turn to the Savior and repent of our sins. My friends, repentance is joy. Sweet repentance is part of a daily process through which, in which line upon line, precept upon precept, the Lord teaches us to live a life centered in His teaching. Like Joseph and Nephi, we can cry unto God for mercy, for He is mighty to save. He can fulfill any righteous desire and longing and can heal any wound in our lives. In the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ, you and I can find countless accounts of individuals who learn how to come into Christ to sincere repentance. I'd like to share with you an example of a tender mercy of the Lord through an experience that occurred in my beloved island of Puerto Rico. It was in my hometown of Ponce. 
that a sister in the church, Celia Ayala, decided that she was going to give a Book of Mormon to a friend. She wrapped it and went to deliver the gift. More precious to her than diamonds and rubies, she said. On her way, a thief approached her, grabbed her, and he grabbed her purse and ran away with a special gift inside. When she told the story at church, her friend said, who knows, maybe this was your opportunity to share the gospel. Well, a few days later, you know what happened? Celia received a letter. I hold that letter that Celia shared with me in my hand today. And it says the same, Miss Cruz, forgive me, forgive me. You will never know how sorry I am for attacking you. But because of it, my life has changed and will continue to change. The Book of Mormon has helped me in my life. The dream of that man, God has shaken me. I am returning your five dollars for I cannot spend them. I want you to know that you seem to have a radiant about you. That lie seems to stop me from harming you. So I ran away instead. I want you to know that you will see me again. But when you do, you won't recognize me, for I will be your brother. Here where I live, I have to find the Lord and go to the church you belong to. The message you wrote in that book brought tears to my eyes. Since Wednesday night, I have not been able to stop reading it. I have prayed and asked God to forgive me, and I ask you to forgive me. I thought your rap gift was something I could sell. Instead, it was made me want to change my life. Forgive me, forgive me. I beg you, your unknown friends. Brothers and sisters, the light of the Savior can reach us all, no matter our circumstances. It is not possible for you to sink lower than the infinite light of Christ's atonement shines, say President Jeffrey R. Holland. As of the unintended recipient of Celia's gift, the Book of Mormon, the brother went to witness more of the Lord's mercy, although it, looks, it took time for him to forgive himself, he finds joy in repentance. What a miracle. One faithful sister, one Book of Mormon, sincere repentance, and the Savior power led to the enjoyment, enjoyment of the blessings of the fullness of the gospel and sacred covenants in the house of the Lord. Other family members follow and accept sacred responsibility in the Lord's vineyard including full-time missionary service. As we come unto Jesus Christ and our path of sincere repentance, you will eventually lead us to the Savior's holy temple. What a righteous motive to strive to be clean, to be worthy of the fullness of the blessings made possible by our Heavenly Father and His Son through sacred temple covenants. Serving regularly in the house of the Lord, striving to keep the sacred covenants we make there will increase both our desire and our ability to experience the change of heart, mind, mind, and soul necessary for us to become more like our Savior. President Russell M. Nelson has testified, nothing will open the heavens more than worshiping in the temple. Nothing. My dear friends, do you feel inadequate? Do you feel unworthy? Are you second-guessing yourselves? Perhaps you might worry and ask, do I measure up? Is it too late for me? Why do I keep failing when I'm trying my absolute best? Well, brothers and sisters, surely we will make mistakes in our lives along the way. But please remember that as Elder Gary W. Gunn has taught, our Savior atonement is infinite and eternal. Each of us strays and falls short. We may for a time lose our way. God lovely assures us that no matter where we are or what we have done, there is no point of no return. He waits ready to embrace us. As my dear Cari Lou has also taught me, we need to repent, rewind, and reset the time to zero o'clock every single day. Obstacles will come, 
Let us not wait for things to get hard before turning to God. Let us not wait until the end of our mortal life to truly repent. Instead, let us now, no matter which part of the covenant path we're on, focus on the redemptive power of Jesus Christ and on Heavenly Father's desire for us to return. The Lord's house, His holy scriptures, his holy prophet and apostles inspire us to strive to our personal holiness through the doctrine of Christ. And Nephi said, and now my beloved brethren, this is the way and there is no other way nor name given under heaven whereby men and women can be saved in the kingdom of God. And now this is the doctrine of Christ and the only true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Our process of at one with God may feel challenging, but you and I can pause, be still, look to the Savior, and seek to find and act on how will have us change. As we do so with full intent, we will witness His healing and think how our posterity will be blessed as we embrace the Lord's gift of repentance. The master potter taught my dad, will mold I refine us, which can be difficult nonetheless. The master healer will also cleanse us. I have experienced and continue to experience that power. I testify it comes to faith in Jesus Christ and daily repentance. Oh, it is wonderful that he should care for me enough to die for me. I testify of God and of his infinite power, his son atonement. We can full and fully profoundly sincere and wholeheartedly repent. My friends, I am a witness of the glorious restoration of the gospel to the prophet Joseph Smith and the current divine guidance of the Savior to his prophets and mouthpiece. President Russell M. Nelson, I know Jesus Christ lives and that he is the master healer of our soul. I know and I testify these things are true in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We thank those who have spoken to us and express appreciation to the missionary choir for the beautiful music. We remind you that the nationwide broadcast of Music and the Spoken Word will air tomorrow morning from 9.30 to 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. The Sunday morning session of General Conference will immediately follow. Our concluding speaker for this session will be Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Following his remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing, Come, Lord Jesus. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Robert M. Danes of the Seventy. My beloved brothers and sisters, sitting on the stand today, I have watched this conference center fill up three times for the first time since COVID, fill up with devoted disciples of Jesus Christ who are eager to learn. I commend you for your faithfulness, and I love you. Ezra Taft Benson served as the president of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints from November 1985 until May 1994. I was 33 years old when President Benson became the president of the church and 42 when he passed away. And his teachings and testimony influenced me in that stage of my life in profound and powerful ways. One of the hallmarks of President Benson's ministry was his focus upon the purpose and importance of the Book of Mormon. He emphasized repeatedly that the Book of Mormon is the keystone of our religion, the keystone of our testimony, the keystone of our doctrine, and the keystone in the witness of our Lord and Savior. 
He also often emphasized teachings and warnings about the sin of pride found in this Latter-day Testament of Jesus Christ. A particular teaching by President Benson greatly impacted me <clears throat> and continues to influence my study of the Book of Mormon. He said, the Book of Mormon was written for our day. The Nephites never had the book, neither did the Lamanites of ancient times. It was meant for us. Mormon wrote near the end of the Nephite civilization. Under the inspiration of God, who sees all things from the beginning, Mormon abridged centuries of records choosing the stories, speeches, and events that would be most helpful to us. President Benson continued, each of the major writers of the Book of Mormon testified that he wrote for future generations. If they saw our day and chose those things which would be of greatest worth to us, is not that how we should study the Book of Mormon? we should constantly ask ourselves, why did the Lord inspire Mormon to include this account in his record? What lesson can I learn from this admonition to help me live in this day and age? President Benson's statements help us to understand that the Book of Mormon is not primarily a historical record that looks to the past. Rather, this volume of scripture looks to the future and contains important principles, warnings, and lessons intended for the circumstances and challenges of our day. Hence, the Book of Mormon is a book about our future and the times in which we do now and will yet live. I pray for the assistance of the Holy Ghost as we now consider relevant lessons for us today from the Book of Helaman in the Book of Mormon. The record of Helaman and his sons describes a people who were anticipating the birth of Jesus Christ. The half century recounted in the scriptural record highlights the conversion and righteousness of the Lamanites and the wickedness, apostasy, and abominations of the Nephites. A series of comparisons and contrasts between the Nephites and Lamanites from this ancient record are most instructive for us today. The Lamanites had become, the more part of them, a righteous people, insomuch that their righteousness did exceed that of the Nephites because of their firmness and their steadiness in the faith. And there were many of the Nephites who had become hardened and impenitent and grossly wicked, insomuch that they did reject the word of God and all the preaching and prophesying which did come among them. And thus we see that the Nephites did begin to dwindle in unbelief and grow in wickedness and abominations while the Lamanites began to grow exceedingly in the knowledge of their God. Yea, they did begin to keep his statutes and commandments and to walk in truth and uprightness before him. And thus we see that the Spirit of the Lord began to withdraw from the Nephites because of the wickedness and the hardness of their hearts. And thus we see that the Lord began to pour out His Spirit upon the Lamanites because of their easiness and willingness to believe in His words. Perhaps the most stunning and sobering aspect of this decline into apostasy by the Nephites is the fact that all these iniquities did come unto them in the space of not many years. How could a once righteous people become hardened and wicked in such a short period of time? How could people so quickly forget the God who had blessed them so abundantly? In a powerful and profound way, the negative example of the Nephites 
is instructive for us today. Pride began to enter into the hearts of the people who professed to belong to the Church of God because of their exceedingly great riches and their prosperity in the land. They set their hearts upon riches and the vain things of this world because of that pride which they suffered to enter into their hearts, which lifted them up beyond that which is good because of their exceeding great riches. Ancient voices from the dust plead with us today to learn this everlasting lesson. Prosperity, possessions, and ease constitute a potent mixture that can lead even the righteous to drink the spiritual poison of pride. Allowing pride to enter into our hearts can cause us to mock that which is sacred, disbelieve in the spirit of prophecy and revelation, trample under our feet the commandments of God, deny the word of God, cast out, mock, and revile against the prophets, and forget the Lord our God, and desire not that the Lord our God, who hath created us, should rule and reign over us. Therefore, if we are not faithful and obedient, we can transform the God-given blessing of prosperity into a prideful curse that diverts and distracts us from eternal truths and vital spiritual priorities. We always must be on guard against a pride-induced and exaggerated sense of self-importance, a misguided evaluation of our own self-sufficiency and seeking self instead of serving others. As we pridefully focus upon ourselves, we also are afflicted with spiritual blindness and miss much, most, or perhaps all that is occurring within and around us. We cannot look to and focus upon Jesus Christ as the mark if we only see ourselves. Such spiritual blindness also can cause us to turn out of the way of righteousness, fall away into forbidden paths, and become lost. As we blindly turn unto our own ways and follow destructive detours, we are inclined to lean upon our own understanding, boast in our own strength, and depend upon our own wisdom. Samuel the Lamanite succinctly summarized the turning away from God by the Nephites. Ye have sought all the days of your lives for that which ye could not obtain and ye have sought for happiness in doing iniquity, which thing is contrary to the nature of that righteousness which is in our great and eternal head. The Prophet Mormon observed, the more part of the people remained in their pride and wickedness, and the lesser part walked more circumspectly before God. In the book of Helaman, the increasing righteousness of the Lamanites provides a stark contrast to the rapid spiritual decline of the Nephites. The Lamanites turned to God and were brought to a knowledge of the truth by believing the teachings in the Holy Scriptures and of prophets, exercising faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of their sins, and experiencing a mighty change of heart. Therefore, as many as have come to this, ye know of yourselves, are firm and steadfast in the faith and in the thing wherewith they have been made free. Ye should behold that the more part of the Lamanites are in the path of their duty, and they do walk circumspectly before God, and they do observe to keep His commandments and His statutes and His judgments. They are striving with unwearied diligence that they may bring the remainder of their brethren to the knowledge of the truth. As a consequence of the righteousness of the, of the Lamanites did exceed that of the Nephites because of their firmness and their steadiness 
in the faith. Moroni declared, Behold, the Lord hath shown unto me great and marvelous things concerning that which must shortly come at that day when these things shall come forth among you. Behold, I speak unto you as if you were present, and yet ye are not. But behold, Jesus Christ hath shown you unto me, and I know your doing. Please remember that the Book of Mormon looks to the future and contains important principles, warnings, and lessons intended for me and you in the circumstances and challenges of our present day. Apostasy can occur at two basic levels, institutional and individual. At the institutional level, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will not be lost through apostasy or taken from the earth. The Prophet Joseph Smith proclaimed, The standard of truth has been erected. No unhallowed hand can stop the work from progressing. The truth of God will go forth boldly, nobly, and independent till it has penetrated every continent, visited every clime, swept every country, and sounded in every ear, till the purposes of God shall be accomplished and the great Jehovah shall say, the work is done. At the individual level, each of us must beware of pride, lest we become as the Nephites of old. May I suggest that if you or I believe we are sufficiently strong and stalwart to avoid the arrogance of pride, then perhaps we already are suffering from this deadly spiritual disease. Simply stated, if you or I do not believe we could be afflicted with and by pride, then we are vulnerable and in spiritual danger. In the space of not many days, weeks, months, or years, we might forfeit our spiritual birthright for far less than a mess of pottage. If, however, you or I believe we could be afflicted with and by pride, then we consistently will do the small and simple things that will protect and help us become as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon us. Blessed are they who humble themselves without being compelled to be humble. As we follow President Benson's counsel and ask ourselves why the Lord inspired Mormon to include in his abridgment of the Book of Helaman the accounts, admonitions, and warnings that he did, I promise we will discern the applicability of these teachings to the specific conditions of our individual lives and families today. As we study and ponder this inspired record, we will be blessed with eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to comprehend, and hearts to understand the lessons we should learn to beware of pride, lest we should enter into temptation. I joyfully witness that God, the Eternal Father, is our Father. Jesus Christ is His only begotten and beloved Son. He is our Savior. And I testify that as we walk in the meekness of the Lord's Spirit, we will avoid and overcome pride and have peace in Him. I so witness in the sacred name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Our Father in heaven, we are full of love and our hearts are full of reverence for thee. And we pray that with this love and reverence and in thy name, we can go out into our families and wards and try to help thy kingdom come and thy will be done in our lives and wards and cities. We pray for our daily needs so that we can help others get what they need every day. We pray for forgiveness for our failures and our sins and shortcomings. And may we be more like thee in love and mercy and forgive others and seek peace with others who offend us. We're grateful for uh, the teachings of the prophets and the apostles and the gospel of thy Son to prepare us against trial and temptation. And finally, we uh, pray that we can be loyal and faithful members of thy kingdom and seek thy power and thy work and thy glory and the immortality and eternal life of our fellow men. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
This has been a broadcast of the Saturday evening session of the 194th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session was provided by a choir of missionaries currently serving in the Utah area. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. <laughs>